Okay, there we are. Hey, everybody. Christina here with Indigo River Tiny Homes, and I've got Lindsay, the tiny home lady. We're so excited to get together and talk about the festival and talk a little bit about tiny home financing, since that's a big sticking point for a lot of folks. We know that is. And so we're going to share what we know that is working right now and what we see on the horizon. And then we'll share a little bit about um, some just some updates for the festival, some more folks that have signed on since the last time we went live and, you know, what we have planned for, for everybody in nine days at the Gather and Create Festival. We've got nine days. Yes. Tiny home builders, tiny home experts. We've got land developers. We've got folks that know about financing. Lindsay is one of them. Lindsay knows about all the all things tiny. <laughs> um, and then we've got lots of other folks that kind of specialize in financing or land or, you know, Lindsay covers them all and then can connect you with the people that can go more in depth with yep. those topics. It's not everything. It's it's not also, it's what you know and who you know. In my case, it's both. But the beauty of who you know is so key. Just like any industry, there's going to be experts in their field. And in this industry that's so new, there's builders, there's consultants, there's people that set the homes, there's people that finance the homes. And if we all just really stay really good in our own lane and work to collaborate with one another, we're going to be good. Like we have got, because there's so much to do. For me to pick up the tools and start building a home, I'm not the best person. <laughs> I'll tell you, you that. Did it. Right? You did it and you found people to help you. I did it because I had to do it because our builder went out of business. So for anyone that is not familiar with me, I'm Lindsay, the tiny home lady. And our journey into our tiny home started in 2017 when we were living in the very expensive area of San Rafael, which is one about 20 minutes north of San Francisco. And everything around us was like a million dollars to buy. That was like your fixer upper. I remember going into a house, total outdated everything, and it was a million dollars. So it's just so much money. I couldn't even fathom it. The other thing is we really wanted to travel too. So it presented itself a really great opportunity for us to go tiny. And we chose a pretty big tiny home to start. It was all custom homes back then. Remember 2017? There weren't any models, people, barely any financing around. Right, yeah. Not even one city uh, had been legalized for tiny homes yet. So that's where we were at that state of the industry. Nowadays, we've got more financing. Companies are doing models. Like you guys have your models that people can purchase. Uh, you know, just a whole gamut. But when we started, we customized our own home. And then our builder went out of business right in the middle of the build. Yeah. Yeah. Not many people are like, uh, could you necessarily handle that situation? Most yeah. people say no, unless you know going into DIY. And I know the Gather and Create show is going to have a lot of people. They're very eager about DIYing. Yes, yes. We and talk there, to a lot of those folks. There also may be a hybrid. There's a, there's there's sort of an interest. I kind of look at like DIY over here and 100% custom build over there. And there's like a whole series of opportunities in the middle. And somewhere, you know, from DIY over here, there's maybe a hybrid where you have a builder build the shell. It may put in the plumbing, the electrical, all the stuff that if you do wrong can be a real big problem. You do the wrong roofing, you do the wrong windows, you got leaks, you got problems. So you want to do that stuff right. And, you know, it's not for the light of pain of heart that are going to figure it out with YouTube channel videos. Right. <laughs> you want <it. laughs> So there's a whole nother option of like somewhere in the middle and then you could finish your own flooring, your cabinets, the things that are not, you know, quite critical for structural, you know, we're putting these homes out on the roads that are dealing with earthquake conditions and hurricane winds. So you got to make sure you build it right. And that's, what's so great about companies like Indigo that are building. And then the ones that are coming out to the, the festival gather and create and the ones that I always work with and network with, um, and I'm often getting sent, you know, requests from people like, what do you think of this home that's online? Number one thing I'm like, is it certified? That's all. Is it certified? And there's a few certifiers out there. I know you guys work with NOAA. Um, our home was certified by PacWest. Then there's RVIA for a few builders out there. Not a lot of them. They're kind of more your grandfathered in, 
you know, builders out there. There's even companies that are doing NTA. So it's not like there's a ton of certifiers out there, but you absolutely need to make sure it's certified uh, yes. for a variety of reasons. Um, financing, which we're going to talk about, may be one of those, that there may be a requirement for the home to be certified. I know of a one bank, actually both banks that we're going to talk about require certification. Um, and oftentimes it's not, if a home's never been certified and it's already been built, it's a tough one to get certified. So you want to yeah. get it dialed in and any builder like Indigo, you guys already do it from the get-go. Every home that you generate is certified. So absolutely. We had to kind of back backtrack into that and find the certifier. And we didn't quite know. We thought RVA was the gold standard. Come to find out uh, that's a good standard for the RV industry, but not necessarily the best one for the tiny home industry, because I'm just going to say it. The RVA is really eager about their their models and their building standards. Yes. And when tiny home people try to live full time in units that are built for temporary living, the first people that are lobbying against that is the whole RVIA. So there's, you know, yeah, it's a little, it's a little convoluted, but I would say getting a right certification with the builder that already is doing the right thing is what we had to do. And then I turned one big giant bunch of lemons of our experience into lemonade and created the Go Tiny Academy, as well as I do consulting with people. I also do with consulting with new builders. I have a number of builders that are interested. They may build sheds or they build other things in other industries and they want to come in to this industry because they really are excited to, you know, build the tiny homes. Uh, so it's it's really something I love doing. And one of the other cool things I love doing is the Go Tiny VIP tours, which we're coordinating and activating there at the Gather and Create Festival. And so I can share a little bit more about what those look like if you want yes. to dive And I just want to say before you tell everybody about the magic that you weave, you know, with the, the folks that show up and are ready there to learn, um, you know, we are so grateful for people like you that, you know, are because we're so busy building. You know, we do some education. We do some, you know, we do a lot of one on one education with customers that come to us. Um, but it is a big job to, you know, to wrap your brain around all of the different codes and kinds of tiny homes. And, you know, we've got stuff on our website, but that's, you know, not always enough for people. And so we're so glad that you are, are existing in the world, but also that you're able to come to the festival and help folks. Cause that's another thing when we're, at, when we're doing a show, we're so busy, you know, talking to folks about our house that we built and how you can build a house with us that sometimes those other topics, you know, we don't really have time to address those. So we're so glad that you're going to be there and ready to help folks kind of personalized and one-on-one, -on -one, you know, because it's, it's going to save folks a lot of time. Yes. And it really started with the 15 minute discovery call, which I don't allow to the public right now. I don't have any link on my website. They can only get this by, uh, you know, reaching out to me through social, like DMing me or being at a speaking event, or let's say in a VIP tour. Right? So I always want to customize for them because the reality, I call it three pillars of going tiny. There's the land, there's the finance, and then there's the build part of your situation. And you know, just taking one silo of land, are you wanting permits or are you wanting to be under the radar? Do you want it on wheels? Do you want it permanent? Those two questions right there are going to guide you down a whole different path. The other part that I really teach about, especially with land, is there's this thing called zoning law. I was kind of like, put my hand here for the land, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's the building standards. So there's the yeah. home and how it's built. And then there's the zoning law, what's allowed and what's not allowed. And those two, based on your answer to one of my questions, which is, do you want to get it permitted and be legal in the eyes of the jurisdiction? Or do you want to be under the radar? We are not the police here. If you answer under the radar, I'm like, cool, your yep. job is much easier. Then we can just check right. out the box. Let's figure this out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Then you're like, do you want to do gray water? Do you want to do a compost? I mean, whatever. I just went to three site walks yesterday. And one of the three wants theirs on wheels and not with permits. So we talked about watering the garden with her 
shower and all that. But if she was to do it with permits, no can do, right? In that area, yeah. Just yeah. the jurisdictions don't allow compost toilets. They don't allow gray water and watering the garden. Whereas a lot of us are like, it makes total sense to take my shower water and all those things. It's just, you have to know the two worlds. And if you're investing a lot of money into where you're going to be, then you've got to, you know, make sure you're doing the right thing. So that's just the land part. Then we really focus on the finance because how you want to pay for your home, if it's all cash, then you have a lot of options, right? If you have equity in your home and you want to do a home equity line of credit, that's going to have a certain pathway of options. And then if you want to buy a home that's built to more of an RV standard, then you're going to have a very specific kind of a little more narrow of options for getting loans for that. The good news is we've got some pretty good long terms, even if the interest rate is a little higher than your regular real estate, the terms are up to 25 years, which at that point you're really 28. close to it. Oh, 28. Yeah. At for 21st mortgage is 28 years. The, yeah. For the is that with land? Years. Um, no, I don't think that. Okay. I don't think anybody's done rolled land into any of their loans. That there is an built. option with land. It's a lot more paperwork and it's a lot yeah. more complex and involved, but it is possible, which is really great news. The fact that you can do land and that, because we have many people that want to quote unquote, buy land and put a tiny home on it. Mm -hmm. And back again to the zoning law, just a quick factoid is your minimum size requirement. If you're in a situation, I'm just going to use Texas. It's the one state in the union that by and large, many of the counties are like you is unrestricted for the type of homes you can put on there. Yay for Texas. Out in California, where I'm from, Not very so little much. unrestricted <laughs> land. There's, you know, a lot of restrictions, many more. And yeah. anywhere there's more urbanization. So even in Texas, if you're trying to put it in like the county right outside of Austin, you're going to have zoning restrictions mm -hmm. versus way more rural. So you got to think about where you want to live. You're like, oh, I really want to be downtown and be near Austin. You're going to have. You so know, that I don't know if you know that that Austin um, legalized ADUs and that you can even have an RV on wheels and put it in your backyard. Oh, and that's that's kosher now. Yes, yeah, so even like downtown. But only yep. in Austin. <laughs> so, right. Only in the town of Austin. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, like, the towns surrounding Austin are all different. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you get into, well, it's very expensive land to go put a smaller home there. So, those are all the factors that go on. And I've been dealing with, I really have been having these calls. I would say hundreds and hundreds of calls like this for the last six years. Mm -hmm. Early days, you know, once again, we have very, we had no financing. Uh, we didn't have anyone be knowing how to set the homes and figuring out how to permit them. And we didn't have much um, in, the legalization. And just six years later, we've got a lot more options for people. Yes, it's bananas how fast it has grown. Because in the beginning, we, we started building our first Tiny Home on Wheels in 2017, toward the end of 2017. Labor Day. It was when we went and got the trailer in Colorado, you know, and oh God, we kind of, we had similar paths. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, it was a side business at first, you know, and then became our main gig. But, you know, I was very disheartened when I realized that, you know, the reality of the institutions being so far behind and so yeah. resistant and, so, you know, the bank issue was a huge one for us. And so we could only do cash deals in the very yep. beginning. And yep. then finally some banks started coming onto the scene and we, you know, thank God. Cause yeah, folks need to finance their home, you know? So let's chat a little bit more about Salim and how you guys connected because Texas is a very unique state in regards to the manufacturer and the dealer scenario. So yes. share a little bit more about that. Yeah, so if you build more than five tiny homes a year, you have to sell through a dealer. Um, so it's just like a car dealership. You yep. know, you get your dealer's license and um, we were, we, I don't, I don't even know originally how we connected with Sal, but, you know, Peter just, you know, was one day was like, yeah, we, we found a dealer, <laughs> you know, and, and, and not just that, but he knew about tiny homes. He knew about 
and he knows a lot about financing and he, you know, he's been doing a lot of real estate work for years and years. So, you know, he knew how to help people find a place to park their house and he knew, you know, so he has been our dealer and has been so great, you know, helping people with financing and, um, you know, his, his dealership is Little Homes of Texas and he's, um, just a great resource, you know, for us as a builder, but also, you know, for our customers and for anybody who's, you know, looking for a tiny house, he's got some used models, you know, for sale on his property and it's, he's close to Houston, um, but he's coming to the festival and he's going to, he's bringing a house. So we're Yay. so excited um, to have him there, but also have another house to show and for people to walk through and feel what it feels like. And, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if his the house he's bringing is for sale. I hope it is. I know we have three that are going to be for sale, and then a school he's going to be for sale, and and a few other ones. Um, oh, so come shopping, people! Come, yeah, bring totally. Your and your ideas. And what's really nice is, you know, for people that are like, I'm really flexible, and I just need, you know, these certain parameters. I get it. Everyone has like loft, no loft, you know, one bedroom, you know, all those kind of major things, but this would be a great place to go and bring that, you know, interest, especially if like people want to just rent something on your property, you want to do something as an Airbnb. Those are great places to just come and pick up the home, yes. have it delivered and start your journey into the tiny home right away. So I made sure to put in the link and we'll, we'll, I just checked the YouTube on um, live and we'll be able to put in comments later with okay. all these links, because what I did is I put in little homes of Texas forward slash Indigo river, because, you know, Sal represents a number of builders there similar, like decathlon also a manufacturer in the state of Cal in the state of Texas, excuse me. Then they also need a representation of a dealer. So if you were to go to Indigo River and you type on their financing page, who you're going to find there is Sal. Do you guys also do Liberty? I can't remember. Yes, we are. Um, we are an approved Liberty builder. Um, yeah. So uh, Liberty uh, 21st Mortgage through Sal really is preferable because he can help with down payment issues, you know, the. 21st requires yes. 20% down, but Sal can sometimes get that to a 10% down payment. Um, and then we have a couple of other options on our financing page that are kind of real niche specific lenders that, um, well, Lightstream, of course, that's just a, a personal loan. That's um, open. So, yeah. You know, it's not for everybody, but some people have used that. We've had, we've had several customers, maybe they had half the money. And so then they just got, right. you know, the other half through from Lightstream or something like that. And then, um, a local guy that does um, does some lending, but really 21st Mortgage has done most, you know, the vast majority of the lending on our homes. And because I have this research, like I basically have an entire module around financing because my Go Tiny Academy, I structured very much to the three pillars of going tiny. So there's six modules, but like there's three main core ones and that's the land, the finance and the build. And what I've learned from doing a lot of research on the finance is that Liberty Bank of Utah having that 20% down, they also are absolutely going to require employment. Well, for some people that are retired, they've got the income, but they don't have the employment. 21st would actually be the option, the best option for you. They also have a longer payment time. It depends on your age. Obviously, if you're you know, in your 70s, you may not get the 30 year. Um, so it really depends on, you know, credit profiling is 100% a thing. However, with Liberty, you have to be employed. You have to be okay. employed by the time you pre get pre-approved and you have to be employed, you know, the many months down depends on how many, how much many months it takes to build the home. So those are some of the things that kind of take a lot of people that are like, oh, this is my forever home. I'm going to retire. I'm going to put it in my backyard of my son or my family's property. Then you really want to go with 21st, right? Yeah. So with Liberty Bank, obviously, um, 20% down and certain, you know, it's great that you have those different options to offer. Yeah. And 21st also does the land and the tiny home purchasing. Yes. And it yeah. is possible to get a separate land loan, you know, if, 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 you know, like my husband can get a VA loan, you know, for land, but then, you know, a different, we have to do a different kind of loan if we're going to build a tiny house. So, you know, there's, there are options out there. Um, you just have to get creative and, and, you know, find, 
find the, the thing that's going to work best for your situation. Yes. Yeah, so on this tour, basically, I spent probably a lot more of my time focused on the zoning and the land stuff, because that's the part where like, one, we don't learn that in school. Two, if you're going to place this anywhere, it's going to involve that whole building standard and zoning law. Um, and at least to do the research about it, even if the land is zoned for put every anything you want on it, you're likely also going to have to need to deal with if they're septic hookups to sewer. What is the water situation, right? It's those utilities that can also be quite costly, especially with septic systems. It's just, is that reality? I walked a property yesterday and the septic system was already installed. Nice. Right, to the tune of, I think it was $50,000 that they had put in there. Yep. So it you know, really had loved up their property. So if you are not aware of those things, then a lot of times what people just look at is just the price of the home. Right. But if you're going to be developing land, you've got to develop the utilities. And regardless of unrestricted land, they're not going to let you just put raw sewage and anything anywhere. You do right. have to get permits for that. <laughs> yeah. In Texas, you can you can do gray water as long as you build a gray water runoff system. Oh my God, that's amazing. So, so I didn't know about that. I yeah. Love that. Wow. That yeah, is so inspiring. not very many people do that. Most people just go ahead and find a place to, you know, have their sewage go into a a septic system or a, or a city sewage, but you know, it is possible and it's great for your garden. Gray water is such a great nourishing thing to put yeah, in. So let's not can... use our, our fresh virgin water for, for garden. <laughs> let's do a second use. However, I yeah. could imagine that the challenge is yes, you can do your gray water, but what do you do about your black water? If you have a yeah. flush toilet, so do they have any allowances for compost toilets yet? So you just, you, in Texas, if you're, you know, especially if you're parking a tiny home on wheels, you know, most people, a lot of people will do a composting toilet because there isn't a septic system, you know, right. nearby. And so, or they have the comp, they get a composting toilet because they want to have options. So then they might be near, you know, where they can let their gray water go in the sewer, but they just already have their composting toilet ready or their incinerator toilet. We, we do incinerator toilets too. And those are really good, um, less maintenance and, you know, you just empty the ash. Right. instead of you know the the bucket do you, find, do you find people are getting permitted for that with the compost toilet i don't i'm not aware of it being necessary okay because um, as long as you're not dumping it on the ground you know you're you're sure. okay if you you know if you if you compost it in a appropriate way then it's going to be fine okay so far Great. so good you know yeah. <laughs> Here in California, we do not have that. We have very specific, you can compost, but it has to be NSF certified. Oh, wow. um, one of the toilet companies that I'm working with has figured out it's going to be a 12 month process just to get certified for NSF oh, wow. because they have to show it's all about microorganisms and pathogens. That's mm -hmm. their biggest issue. You know, if you have any pathogen that enters a water system or any gets into anything, now we have a public health problem, right? So right. they want to make sure these toilet systems are good. Uh, there's some other things like hold and haul where you can hold your tank and then the hall can come by and- Oh and yeah. It yep. Yeah, services like that. Yeah, and people ask me about the composting toilet and I'm like, it's an ecosystem, just like a fish tank. You know, if you maintain it, it will be healthy and it will be fine. But if you don't maintain it, it can be a problem. So, you know, it's it's a personal choice if you're- if you're wanting to go the composting route, but and we had options, so we kind of got off off topic because yeah. we we're, were supposed to be talking about financing and the, but that is a very popular topic. We get a lot of questions about about, yes. about that, and that is one of the aspects that you know, based on what your standards that you're building to, what the land is, what kind of options do you have available? So really, it comes down to like wheels and permanent will largely be dictated by that zoning law. And if they've allowed movable tiny homes and if they haven't. And so, and then some people have to also, you know, they have to understand like movable tiny homes do not appreciate the land value that they're on. So you might have a different choice point, you know, or if you're never going to move it a lot. I know there's a big movement also in the tiny home industry for builders to start building to more of a modular or factory built which would then start applying to the local, like for in your case, the Texas building code, which is based off the international residential code. 
Is that something you guys are entertaining at all and have been discussing? Um, I mean, we're so far, we're doing pretty well with NOAA and RVIA um, just because those are accepted in a lot of the, yeah. you know, tiny home villages and parks and stuff yeah. where people are parking. Um, and then if you're outside the city limits, you know, in Texas, you know, for now and hopefully forever, <laughs> you can do what you're you want to do you know, oh. land. So, and we build mostly on wheels. I mean, we are, we, we are, yes. Um, we have a few um, different avenues that we're looking at with building with SIPs so that we can build something on, well, sorry, I should say not on foundation, build it for a foundation yes. and then take it there on skip. Yep. yep. So that, uh, yes. Absolutely. So that would be under our IRC and, and we still have to go through that whole process. RVIA was not fun or easy. So, and then NOAA is easy because we're, we just build to their standards, you know, yeah. we're just already building it and then they just inspect it. Yeah. And they inspect it through a phone, right? It's so great. The best part is that it's recorded. And so it's on file for your home forever. So if you ever want to sell it or if any, or if you want to move it somewhere and they want to say, we want to yeah. see how your house was built, you know, in Colorado, they're asking those questions. So yes. you, know, you can show them the video inspections of your house and your build and your insulation and your wiring and all the things. <laughs> so it's a great service. We love Noah. It's so important because one of our um, major issues within our tiny home with our builder going out of business, I, it was such a an interesting experience because we had so many problems happen. But the good news is, is that I, that's so much more education I have to share. Yeah. Uh, down to the trailer was under um, weighted. Oh, right. We had to change out our tires and our axles. That is like what the guy that did it, he goes, we're basically going to do surgery on your home. So you might want to go to a cafe. And they did that. It unwelled the trailer on um, whole uh, axle chassis. That was so to the tune of $5,400. Right. At the time, our trailer cost 11000 which these gooseneck trailers cost a lot more than that. Oh, these double days. it. Yeah. Double that. Yeah, almost. Because we paid another $5,000 to put on new tires and new axles and everything. Um, our axles were actually dipped down. Oh, gosh. We had driven one direction from Utah to California. It was not even very. So then we had to get axles that were actually appropriate for the weight of the home. Right. The other major one was wiring. They We had a solar system on the top, and they were using regular residential Romex um, wiring to go from the very powerful direct current solar panels to the inverter. That is the one time when your insulation quality of the wire needs to be really good and encased in a metal conduit. And wow. ours is running right through a wood structure like they were oh, ready to close up the walls. Oh. So working with builders, this is always the kind of thing like, how are we to know? I'm not an electrician. I'm not a builder. That's why I go to trust people like Indigo that know what they're doing so that when the walls are closed up and they're getting certified and checked by NOAA to make sure that the home and the wiring and the plumbing and all the things that go into the home mm -hmm. are being done correctly. So I can't speak enough for quality builders that have been doing it for a long time. What is your guys' background? Like what was Peter's background before you opened up this part-time tiny Oh gosh, home? well- so he has been, he was a telephone line man right out of, at, well, out of high, sc high school, he went to the army. And so that was how they trained him. And then he worked for Southwestern Bell for a long time until he went to college. He did, you know, in his late twenties, he went back to school and um, got his degree. And then, you know, he's done, he's had a couple of businesses. He thought he wanted to be an accountant. You know, so he got, he's that close to having his master's degree in accounting. And then we got all the student loans, but none of the <laughs> benefits oh. of, <laughs> of a master's degree. So, you know, he, and, and it was interesting because when he was going through that, I was thinking, that's not what he needs to be doing, but it's, his, you know, it's his thing. He, he had to go sure. through that and then, and then realize I'd rather build, you know, I want to, he's, he's, he needs to work with his hands. And so it's great. He has the training. He knows how to do yep. our taxes and he knows, you know, how to, how to communicate with the accountants and, and yes. that in running a business, you know, that was part of his life training for running a business, but totally. his heart is in building and, and tiny structures. So he lived in 350 square feet when I met him and um, was, 
you know, had everything he needed, right? He was, he was finishing up college when, you know, we met in our late yeah. and um, so he, you know, he did some, some different, you know, small businesses, but um, the ones, so Dallas Shed Company was one of our companies. We built our first tiny home actually um, in 2009. We started that business in 2005 and in 2009, um, built a tiny home on foundation in somebody's backyard. Um, and then uh, the the uh, recession <laughs> did us mm -hmm. in. So um, we we ended up he he ended up working in home improvement with Pella Windows and Doors and and a flooring company and um, did a lot of on the side remodeling and helping folks flip houses. So yes. um, if somebody oh. had a house they needed flipped, you know, so some general contracting. A lot of he's done a lot of window replacement, you know, replacing things that some of the things that, you know, were fine and they lasted 30 years and it's just time to replace it. But, you know, replacing things that were not built the way they needed to be built. So he's learned from that experience, like what not to do, what water damage looks like, what, you know, how water infiltration happens, like all right. of those things. So, you know, when, when he, we were in Colorado and, and my sister lives in a small town in Colorado and they were building a tiny house village in Salida. And we saw it in the newspaper and Peter's like, that's what I want to do is build a tiny oh. house on wheels, you know? So we did it, you know, we just started and he was still working at Pella windows and doors at that point. Yep. So, I, you know, every builder I know, either remodeler, I rented um, a little small unit or I did it in my backyard or, I, you know, on the side on the weekend. Uh, same with Nick from California Tiny House. That's exactly how he did it and now has a big factory. Uh uh, I know friends out in Columbus, Ohio, same thing. They're remodelers and now they're getting into this, which is really great because here's the cool thing. Many of those remodelers are building to the state building code. And yet we know based on the building standard of the RV standard of the RV park model, you can do an R5 in the wall. That is a very skinny wall. And that will only result in more heating and cooling based on what's going on in the temperature outside. Right. It literally comes back to like Jay Schaefer's, you know, the godfather tiny home lived in a tiny RV in the middle of winter in Iowa. Well, those heaters just can't keep up. So you're constantly dealing, you dealt with condensation. He was dealing with all kinds of problems in that RV because it was not designed for him to be in sub-zero temperatures inside a thinly insulated home rvs get cold yeah right Even in texas rvs get cold <laughs> right you guys had the cold snap funny enough tiny house concierge alaska moved into her tiny home right into texas exactly in the winter like oh three God. days before the, the winter storm. oh my gosh yeah now she was there in her home maybe without electricity but she was far better off than many people that dealt with that, you know, being in an RV. Yeah. Which is why a lot of the RVs are, you know, like a couple season, not four season. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so having that yeah. quality built tiny home, that is a big, you know, a lot for people they are like, what's the difference? That is a major difference. The other yeah. one is holding its value. Yeah. When you have a home that's built more like a regular home. And in fact, many tiny homes are built better than many homes that are standing. Yes, it's better than a regular home because the, there's reinforcement in the framing. There's a lot of extra things that we do because yes. it's built on wheels and it's got to run down the road and, you know, survive an earthquake and a hurricane at the same time. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, but not all builders do that. So it is really important to get it inspected before you, you know, plunk money down. But, but everybody that's coming to the show in nine days is um builds to uh one of these standards that we're talking about that are higher than you know rvia is kind of the baseline and that helps you get into rv parks but you know you want somebody that builds to a higher standard than rvia so that it has all the insulation and all the full-time living um so the wear and tear, because, you know, if you live in an RV for a little while, you see everything inside just starts to break and the plastic and the, you know, the the particle board just doesn't hold up to full full time living. We have an, a cab over camper and the wall 
Mm, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at the thing going, oh yeah, that'd be really warm. And sure, when it gets hot, we have to have air conditioning on. When it gets cold, we got to have the heater on very quickly. I will be sitting in there and the heater's right next to me and it'll go on, it'll get warm. And then whoop, it's like the, yeah. the goes out of the room. So yeah, you know, for so many people that are looking to place something in on a property and live in it full time through multiple seasons, tiny homes are like a game changer. And this is why we're seeing this industry go grow. I just saw the latest uh, 9.1 billion by 2027. Wow. That is a major game changer. Yeah. You know, there's all this, there's a lot of kind of ancillary things going on with modular offsite construction, like what you guys are talking about. Not everyone wants the wheels and the chassis and the, and the axle, because if you're not going to use that, Right. Why spend all the money for that, right? Well, you can put that money in your foundation on your property. Yeah, because those trailers, you know, when you build on a good trailer, it's not cheap. So yeah, that's what we advise people. You know, if you're, if you don't know, you don't want to move it, then, you know, we just do this, deliver it on skids and put all that trailer money into your foundation on yes. your property. And when you build to that state building code, now your property appreciates in value. That's a really big one. We get into the financial conversation not just from financing, but from an investment standpoint. Yes. Right? Which are you trying to do? But if someone's like, my kids, you know, 18, we're going to put a home in the backyard and then we want them to take it off with them to go to college. Tiny home on wheels all day, every day. Yes, yes, totally. Or There's you want to put there to just test it out and maybe eventually build your bigger accessory dwelling unit. Right. That yeah, there's so many, so many options. And that's what I love is tiny home people are are flexible and creative and you know, they're not afraid to jump in and say, I'm just gonna, you know, try it with this tiny home for five years and then we'll see what happens, you know. Yes. And I I'm thank you, thank you for saying that. What I've been realizing lately, I'm like, you know, there's some people like, well, I want my tiny zoom the all these things. I'm like, you know, and some of them will choose to have something that may happen somewhere down the road that they're making and impacting their decision. Now, for example, mm -hmm. I have a woman that's like, well, I only feel comfortable maybe driving a 24 foot, but not anything bigger. I'm like, have you ever driven anything? No, I haven't. I'll tell you right now from someone that drives a 32 foot long tiny home, driving a 24 or driving a 30 is not too much different. Driving a 24 and driving a 40 that is different. Okay. I will a go for it. Yeah. But, you know, so like I kind of, ex and she was, it was just a total maybe. And I was like, I highly recommend that you might go a little bit bigger of a home there for, based on her lifestyle and everything. Right. Because you can always hire someone. That was another one. Early days, I would get a lot of questions on what kind of truck we drove. Yes. And then I, I got, I got far less of those questions because the big question is like, do you ever want to drive this thing? Because the truck right. that we bought was forty thousand dollars. Now they're more like fifty just to yeah. get a decent truck. That's equivalent to maybe like ten to twelve trips based on how long you need oh, to. Go. Yeah, you can rent well, if you're going to move twice a year. Rent a truck from Enterprise or hire it done. Totally, yeah. yeah. And if you, I mean, if you don't know how to turn corners with a big thing behind you, you rent that. Yeah, right? <laughs> all covered and insured. I mean, we came. This close. My husband was new to driving. I was pretty aware of like turning corners and all that. We came so close to taking out a city sign that would have ruined our tiny home. Yes. Damaged the sign that, you know, all the things. So yeah. Note of like trucks and all that really do some thinking about what the plan is. And, and, you know, if you really, really do want to drive it someday, well, then you go get trained on how to drive it. Yeah. Peter did that for, you know, we built a mobile medical clinic for a church health ministry. And so we had driving lessons with the, you know, the guy that was going to be in charge of driving it to the different locations, you know, we taught him how to drive it. So yeah, yes, exactly. And that's get cool. Some, yeah. Get some advice from somebody that knows how to pull a trailer and then, and then you got to practice. <laughs> we, we towed tiny house concierge, Alaska's tiny home from Colorado to Washington. And there was a point in Arizona where I pulled off the road. We were in this giant dirt lot. And I was like, all right, get in the car. Let's go. Cause she had never done it. And, you know, we did a lot in the parking lot first to yeah. like, let's practice that you're going to be turning on a major road. You're on, you're taking a right-hand turn. 
and here's what you need to do. And then we did that three or four times. She felt good. And then she ended up going on the freeway and, you know, that was her first moment to do that. You know, awesome. is she going to become a trucker and, and start being a transporter? No, but it, it is kind of a cool <laughs> experience. Yeah. Um, my recent adding of skills, I just learned how to change out the tires that blew two of those blew on my tiny home because of that wear pattern on our wheels and all um, that. I just, I've learned so much about tires now. All the things about tires and axles and yeah, trailer yeah. weight and all those things. There's so there's a lot to learn. So that's why we have Lindsay coming to the festival. She can help you guys figure it out and help you figure out which even direction do you need to be looking in? You know, do I need to be looking at this stuff or this stuff, depending on what your goals are? So Lindsay's great to help with personalized, uh, yes. you know, assistance and coaching and, um, and consulting. Great. So and the third pillar was, let's see, land, finance, and build. There's going to be so many builders there. So tell us yes. some of the people that have been so out. Legacy Tiny Homes from Austin is coming up. We've got, of course, Decathlon, um, which is a local builder in uh, DFW area. So they build um, high quality foes like we do, but they do more of uh, kind of the same floor plans over and over. And you can uh, do there's not a whole lot of customization and so when you know we send folks to them sometimes and then when people need customization they send folks to us so um decathlon's gonna have two houses um let's see i've got my list right here that's well, one on that note what christina just mentioned that is so important you guys there's other industries that do not play well in the sandbox they're very competitive we are talking about the manufactured home industry it's been around for decades and decades it's called hud now, after 76, it got transformed into housing urban development. And it's just an industry that's been around for a very long time. But when you have a new scrappy industry like tiny homes and you don't have a lot of financing, you don't have a lot of all the things, and we're sort of just creating it from our own scratch and our own creativity minds, like the wonderful builds that you do, then you need to work together because not we can't all do everything, right? Right. So it's right. great. It's, that okay. has been one of the best things about the tiny house uh, industry and the community. And, you know, one of the reasons that we decided to step up and do the festival, because, you know, the we need a place to gather. We need a place to get together, you know, at least once a year in DFW, because we have, yeah. I don't know if you knew this, but we have the biggest tiny home enthusiast group in the country that, you know, is online, our, our, um, B.A. Norgard was the found, original founder of the Tiny Home Enthusiast Group, and now um, other folks have come and and have picked up the baton and and you know have been nurturing the group. So on Facebook and Meetup, when you combine it, it's the the biggest one in the country. So you know we have a lot of folks here that want they're interested in it, you know, it, and a lot of the enthusiasts in the group are not necessarily going to go tiny, but they let people park in their yard, you know, and they've had schoolies parked in their yard or they've had those parked in their yard, you know, for a year or two or three, you know, for people that needed a short-term place. Um, so it's a wonderful group and, you know, the collaboration is, is, is the rule, you know, there's an exception every once in a while, there's somebody that, you know, feels like they need to guard their secrets or whatever, you know, but for the most part, everybody shares, everybody helps each other out. Everybody lets Absolutely. each other know when there's code changes or when there's, you know, a, a proposed code change or, you know, things like We're that. about to have one. I know it's not for Texas, but it is Colorado. And that's where we saw each other last year in the state of Colorado at the People's Tiny House Festival and um, Colorado Tiny House Festival, which is going to happen right after Gather and Create about, you know, a few weeks later. Uh, no, sorry, in the end of June, a good old month and a half later. So it's really great to just sort of understand more of what's going on because you guys sell to Colorado market, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, we, one of our houses is in Florissant, Colorado on Airbnb. Well, not on oh, Airbnb, perfect. sorry. She just she just rents it out. Um, but I was well, just so looking at my list. Of are coming down from Colorado on May 11th. That is the date to kind of note. Okay. Uh, four of the rules are coming out on May 11th. I'm putting in the chat, Little Homes of Texas. And I do see here, uh, we had some people join us, Michelle and Peggy from the YouTube channel. So hi, Michelle and oh, Peggy. Nice. Awesome. Candace, thank you all for coming out on the YouTube channel. 
Yay. And more yes. people who see that live will be available and we can put links in there. I love and it. I'm going to, I'll repost this with Lindsay's face in there so everybody can see her talking. So <laughs> that'll be better than just having to look at me while Lindsay's talking. Um, but so before we sign off, I just, I want to let everybody know, oh, I want it go back. Oh goodness. All right. I've got my list here of speakers for the stages. Um, and we've been trying to put that up on the website, but um, Lindsay's going to be doing some speeches. Um, well, I should say um, speaking on some panels. She, you're doing your presentation. Um, I forgot the name of it and I don't have it right here. Tell us the name. Of uh, your you want to go tiny. So what's next? I think that's the, the one. Right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Lindsay will be given that presentation and then also serving on a couple of panels. Um, Sal from Little Homes of Texas will be on, uh, well, we think, we hope we'll be on a panel. And then um, we're going to have builders panels uh, both mornings, Saturday and Sunday morning. Um, and then land development panels. So we've got Terry Land Trip from uh, Lake Dallas, Tiny Home Village. Um, Jeffrey Outlaw from Housefly. And who else is on our land development panel? I think two more people now. Oh, I know it's Namaste Hideaway and Cozy Acres, Tiny Home Village. Okay. So they're gonna, yeah, be sharing all their information about how they built their tiny home villages and and you know what it took and and how they were able to um, you know get the city <laughs> to agree to letting them do a tiny home village. And then we're going to have nonprofits there that are going to talk about how to use a tiny home in service. Um, Namaste Hideaway will be doing a presentation. We'll have a vacation rentals panel. We'll also have a tiny homeowners panel. So folks that, you know, some of, we got a couple of our homeowners and then a couple of DIYers that have built their own tiny home that are going to be on that panel. So we've got lots of folks to speak on the stage to, um, inform everybody you know of all the different options and paths and you know hear their stories of how they did it we've we got lots of pioneers tiny home pioneers that have been blazing the trails and can let you know you know how how's it how's it going and and what we see in the future Which love it it's all good right so far I really like know. it for anyone that's you know going to come they are also going to learn and this is what I always tell the people that have come to my VIP tours I'm like you are all now ambassadors of this information. And in fact, you're probably more educated than most people even on the internet because some of that information is not all kind of tidied up nicely in one YouTube video. No. There's many beautiful videos. I love the videos of like the designs and the features, but to kind of get it all in a nutshell, that's where the festivals really come together because you're always going to find the people that have been doing whatever they're doing, even if they did a video a year ago. That is not relevant. Always the, the new, there's new information. Yes. Always. So we always have new just so quickly. Mm -hmm. yep. Yay. Yeah, so we're excited. We hope you guys can join us. And um, on our website, the um, ticket link is there to grab your tickets and then also get the VIP upgrade. So you can meet with Lindsay and she's going to show you all around, show you which builders are good for your particular tiny home goals. Um, and, you know, and, and show you the different types of tiny homes and, and, you know, we'll have a park model there. We'll have those, we'll have schoolies, we'll have, uh, RV conversions, you know, we're going to have all the, all the different options. And then, so you can see them for yourself and then you can see how it fits in with your tiny home goals. And you're going to be at the cool South Park Ranch, which is the home. If anyone watched the show, the mini series, uh, show Dallas, in I think the 80s. I know I did. I'm of that age. And uh, I, I'm super excited to be there on that property and be, you know, in that beautiful place. And and I, I just feel like this is like the first annual, right, of many more to come. I hope so. I think it's it's shaping up to be really a great time. So I think we'll just, we'll just keep it going, keep the momentum going. And, um, you know, springtime in Dallas is a good time to get together before it gets too hot. And, hang out, talk tiny, and just have some fun. Yay. Let's go tiny. Yes. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us and for watching and listening. And um, we will look forward to seeing everybody at the festival and just can't wait to get together and 
um, create more wonderful things in the tiny home community. Yay. Thank you, Christina. Yeah. Thanks, Lindsay. See y'all soon.